Hello and welcome to GameSack. I love 2D games and I love that no one bats an eye if a 2D game shows up on a modern platform. Back in the Saturn, PlayStation, and Nintendo 64 games, critics would often complain if a game were 2D, but not these days. So let's check out some interesting ones. Enough of my stupid face, let's get on to the games. This is Kaze in the Wild Masks from Sodesco for the Nintendo Switch. At least I think it's pronounced Kaze. I mean, it actually could be Kaze since it's not a Japanese game. Actually, yeah, I think I'm going to go with Kaze for that very reason. Anyway, this is available for the other modern platforms as well. All of the vegetables have been turned into evil monsters. So, as Kaze, now it's up to you to save the world. The game's artwork gives off some serious Klonoa vibes, but this game doesn't play anything like that. At first, it's pretty enjoyable. The control is quite responsive and there's lots of things to collect. You do have a few different moves, but you don't have to worry about remembering a ton of different stuff. Most of the controls come naturally and the tutorials aren't intrusive at all. Throughout each area are little reddish purple gems that you can collect. These fill up a gauge once you beat a stage, but other than that, they don't seem to have much of a purpose. There are also two or three bonus stages scattered about each stage. Here, you need to accomplish a task in order to grab a specific gem. Collecting them all doesn't seem to accomplish anything special that's clearly obvious to me anyway. Lastly, there are four tiles in each stage that spell out K's, kind of like the Kong letters in Donkey Kong Country. Collecting all of these doesn't seem to do anything either as you have unlimited lives. So it honestly didn't take long before I stopped collecting anything at all. The stages themselves start out fine and they each have at least one checkpoint midway through. However, I felt that they quickly became a bit too long. Not overly long, but just long enough to where you start wondering when the stage is going to end. Combine that with the fact that you need to play through seven stages before you see a boss means it can start to feel boring. At least the boss fights are fun to learn though. Every once in a while, you're granted a mask which gives you a power of a certain animal that you get to use for the rest of the stage that you're on. This adds some variety to the game and it also helps it from becoming too boring. There are definitely some good ideas for the stages. Also, you can pick up certain objects with your ears and toss them, but this is rarely ever needed to advance. You can float down after a jump which is nice, but I think I would have preferred it if they used the jump button to do this instead of the action button. Graphically, I love how this game looks. It's pixel art, but it's very high resolution pixel art. It gives 16 or 32 bit vibes, but at a much higher resolution, which I absolutely applaud. There's great use of color and the animation is nice. However, the scrolling can get pretty choppy here on the Switch version. I'm not sure if this plagues the other platforms, but it happens here more than it should. The music usually isn't bad, except for the bonus stages where I don't care for it at all. But mostly there are some good tunes to accompany you as you play. Overall, this game isn't horrible by any means. I think it just could use a few tweaks to the stage length. Otherwise, I think you'll find this an enjoyable adventure with a couple of annoying spots. Up next is Battle Axe from Bitmap Bureau and Numskull on the PlayStation 4. It's also on the Switch, Xbox, and PC, of course. Like one of Bitmap Bureau's other games, Xenocrisis, this is a top-down action game and it shares a couple of things in common with it. It's also inspired a little bit by Gauntlet, but not hugely so. Anyway, you can pick from three characters, each of them a bit different. You can play with up to two other players at once as well. I personally found the red-headed guy to be the most well-rounded character. Basically, you have a melee attack and a ranged attack, both of which are unlimited, fortunately. The melee attack works quite well and it has more range than you'd think, which makes it really fun to use. The ranged attack is a bit weaker, but it's still quite effective and you'll use it often. You also have a dash roll, which can harm enemies, but you'll have to wait a few seconds before you can do it again. The other button uses an item if you're carrying one. When enemies die, they drop coins as well as things for points. The coins are the thing that you want to make sure you pick up here. Throughout each stage, you'll find Kickstarter backers to rescue. I'm not sure if this accomplishes anything in the normal game. 
Soon you'll be fighting a boss, which I wish were more fun, at least this first one. He eventually starts throwing common stage enemies at you, and I hate it when I have to fight a boss and stage enemies at the same time. It just feels like a cop-out to me. The boss of this stage isn't threatening enough on his own? Well then, why not try making a more interesting and better boss? Anyway, between each stage you have the ability to buy stuff just like in Xenocrisis. You can add on to your life, get a chicken to help restore life later, increase your walking speed and other stuff. Unfortunately, the stages start getting a bit too long for their own good here. It's certainly not game breaking or anything, but you can feel a bit of boredom start to set in due to all of the sameness. The stage 2 boss is actually pretty fun to fight, no common stage minions here. This game is tough. You get three lives and absolutely no continues. The long stages might make you not want to try again after you've restarted the game a few times. There are two difficulty options, easy and hard, because god forbid there be a normal mode. Seriously though, I recommend the easy mode as it's a lot more enjoyable. The main differences in the difficulty is that the bosses take a lot less damage to defeat and some enemies might take one hit less to die. Even on easy though, this game is very challenging. I like that, I just wish I could continue. One of the items for sale might actually be a continue, but they don't tell you what they do. There's also the infinite mode. Here, your goal is to rescue all of the Kickstarter backers from the level and then go to the exit. This is a nice change of pace, I just wish the visuals changed along with the stages. Speaking of the visuals, the pixel art here is incredible and I love every bit of it. There's lots of little sprites and movement everywhere and the colors are perfect. The animation is smooth and really adds some nice flair to the visual presentation. The music is great too, with a chiptune-esque sound that's similar to 90s arcade games. The composer is Manami Matsume, who's known for her work on games like Mega Man 1 and 2, UN Squadron, Magic Sword, and more. Overall, this game is a lot of fun, I just feel it could use a continue and a save feature. Ninja games were super popular in the 80s and 90s. In fact, why aren't ninjas still just as popular now as they were back then? What the hell is wrong with people? Anyway, let's take a look at two different games that are all about that ninja action. Here's The Messenger from Devolver and Sabotage for the Switch. And of course, it's available for everything else too. In this one, you play as a ninja, trying to deliver a scroll to a clan at the summit of a certain peak, hence the name Messenger. The first thing you think about when saying this one is probably the Ninja Gaiden games that were on the NES. And it's true, a few things here definitely resemble that, especially the climbing on the walls. Oh, and you're a ninja with NES-style graphics, what else are you going to compare to? Kid Nikki Radical Ninja? Anyway, don't go into this one expecting Ninja Gaiden because it's really not. For one, it doesn't have the awesome cutscenes like Ninja Gaiden does. Instead, it has a lot of witty text banter that tries too hard and too often to be funny. Now don't get me wrong, the writing can sometimes be pretty good and often quite humorous, but the game feels like it needs to be funny with almost every line of dialogue. Maybe dial it back just a little. Next, the gameplay is greatly expanded over Ninja Gaiden. Several times throughout any given level, you'll stumble upon a shop. Here you can upgrade your abilities if you have enough yellow gems. This makes the game fun, giving you something to strive for. The gameplay itself is very well done. The control is excellent, and it's always your fault if you die. It's nowhere near as tough as any of the Ninja Gaiden games, but that's okay. There are lanterns in each level that'll give you some gems if you slice them, and if you press jump at the same time, you can jump from that position. You can also do the same with the enemies, and even the enemy projectiles once you've purchased that ability. Sometimes, you'll be given new abilities for free because the stage requires it. Of course there are boss fights, and they're quite engaging. You have unlimited lives, but if you die, a little red guy appears and starts taking your loot for a while after you revive. I'm not really sure why, it doesn't add any fun or strategy. You're gonna die no matter what, and having this extra punishment in the game won't make you try to avoid death any more than you otherwise would've. Its inclusion in the game confuses me. The graphics are NES style pixel art and add a lot of parallax scrolling. The music is also done in an NES style and presented completely in mono. 
I'm not sure why the people who do these type of chiptunes always stick to mono. The graphics don't stick to NES limitations when it comes to scrolling or hell even the aspect ratio. Why should the sound be limited to mono? Actually, there is a bit of stereo in here when you go underwater. I think it's supposed to sound muffled here, but there's still too many high frequencies. At the end of the day though, this is a fantastic game that's very hard to put down despite my minor quibbles. I think that if this game looks even remotely enjoyable to you, you'll have tons of fun with this one. I recommend picking it up if you haven't already. This is Shadow Gangs from JKM Corp for the Xbox One series of consoles. It's also on PC and the Switch. Do you like the arcade version of Shinobi? How about Shadow Dancer on the Genesis? Because this game is heavily inspired by the way those games play, minus the dog and Shadow Dancer, of course. This one adds story and dialogue to the gameplay to give all the characters a little bit more depth. But at its heart, it's Shinobi-inspired action. However, it's not exactly like Shinobi, despite what you're seeing here. You start out as a punk from the 80s who throws stars, and you can open egg-shaped metal chests in each stage. In one of them, there's a power-up which turns you into a ninja with a semi-automatic gun. When you're a ninja, you can also double jump, but I rarely found myself doing this. You can also use ninja magic which will damage most, if not all, enemies on screen. Lastly, you can drop mines if you have them. I never found much use for them, though. This game is a lot tougher than Shinobi, so as a result, you have a life meter instead of the one hit death the original game has. Here, you can take three hits. Most of the other rules are like the arcade Shinobi in the ways that you can touch or bounce off the enemies, as well as needing to rescue a set number of hostages in each stage. The levels in Shadow Gangs here are much longer, so for that reason, there are checkpoints throughout each level, sometimes even multiple checkpoints. You don't have unlimited lives, and you don't even have unlimited continues, but you do have a lot of them. You can also choose which mission you start on just as long as you've made it up to that point if you want to try it again another day, which I really like. Each stage is divided into two different areas and at the end of the second area is a boss fight. These can be pretty tough and they'll take some learning. There are also two types of bonus stages. This one happens between rounds. You need to shoot the ninjas to prevent them from picking up the item. If they do, you can shoot them to drop it. You have to press up to fire at the conveyor at the back. If any ninja makes it off screen with a single item, you lose. If you get both items to drop off the conveyors, you win. You can find the other bonus stages in the rounds themselves. Here, ninjas jump out of the building and land. You have to kill them before they jump away. If even one does, you lose. I like this bonus stage more since it's fast and it really requires you to focus. The graphics in this game are super nice. No pixel art here, everything is drawn in HD. It's almost kind of weird seeing a 2D game with such high resolution. Some of the artwork looks a bit simplified as opposed to mega detailed, but overall, it's still very good. Ooh, and look at that parallax scrolly. Oh yeah. The game is presented in a 4x3 aspect ratio, which really doesn't bother me at all since I'm used to playing so many retro games this way. But there is an option to stretch it if you prefer. Of course, this will distort the image. The music is generally pretty good and even somewhat memorable, but not as memorable as any of the Shinobi games. Weirdly, if you're playing this game on a surround sound setup on the Xbox, you'll only get sound from the center, left surround, and right surround speakers. Basically, the sound wasn't mapped correctly. I don't know if this affects the Switch version. If you're just playing in stereo like a hobo, this won't affect you. Not everything is rosy in Shadow Gang's land. The scrolling tries to be predictive or something, and it's just odd and very wonky. It can really throw you off. It snaps back and forth like a Dave Perry game, just slower. I really don't like the screen doing what it often does in this game. And yikes, some of the enemy placement could certainly use some work. And how the hell are you supposed to get this thing? Like, seriously, how? I cannot get on this ledge no matter what I do. Maybe drop down from above? <laughs> Good luck with that. Sometimes you're jumping around, throwing stars or shooting, desperately fighting to stay alive when... What in the hell just happened there? Okay. Overall, the game has good intentions, but it does need some tweaking to the level design, enemy placement, and the scrolling. Oh, and also the channel mapping for the sound. 
I feel that the gameplay falls into the same trap that many indie games do, in that the designer makes it so that it's challenging to them, but they're the ones that are designing it so there's no surprise, nothing to learn. They know exactly how to get past any situation. It's the same reason why so many Mario Maker levels are insanely difficult instead of outright fun. There was also a Kickstarter that ended February of this year, meaning it's going to come to the Dreamcast and PlayStation 4 and maybe even the PlayStation 5. Might be interesting to take a look at it on the Dreamcast when it comes out. All right, we've got two more games to go. Well, actually three, there's a third ninja game I want to show you, but first, some hack and slash action. Here's Wallachia, Reign of Dracula from Free Agent Games for the Switch. It's also on the PC and the PlayStation 4. This was obviously designed to lure you in with its Castlevania inspiration. From its box art and logo font, to the voice actors that they use, to the fact that you're after Dracula all makes you think about Castlevania Symphony of the Night. The gameplay though is anything but that. This is a straight up action game. Your family was murdered and your brother kidnapped so now you have to get some revenge and hopefully find your brother. You fire arrows in rapid succession and it plays a lot like a run and gun except that you have to press the button for each shot you take. You can change the direction that you fire as you run. If you hold one of the shoulder buttons, you can lock yourself into position and fire in any direction without moving. You can also double jump and slide. You also have orbs that you collect, and once you have enough, you can enable better weapons or a helper. These power-ups tend to be limited, and when you die, the number of orbs you have resets. Speaking of dying, you only have three lives, and I haven't seen any one-ups anywhere so far. You can continue all you want, but you'll have to start from the beginning of the stage. Fortunately, the stages aren't overly long or anything, so it's not a huge deal. The controls, combined with the animation, do feel a bit stiff. I feel like the game doesn't provide me with the tools to respond fast enough to some of the things even when I know what's coming. Still, you do adapt, and I've grown to like the challenge that this game presents. The graphics are good, but there's some shimmering in the scrolling that looks pretty ugly. The game was designed at a lower resolution and then scaled up without any interpolation, which is the reason for the shimmering. The game prides itself in its voice acting, but nothing here particularly stands out. Well, not in a good way, anyway. My cart usually has corpses in it, not a young lady. Don't worry, I won't hurt you. The music, though, is really nice, and it helps make the decision to continue an easy one. Overall, this is a game that will take some time to learn in order to succeed. All in all, I've got to say that I ended up liking this one more than I thought I would when I first started playing it. It's not amazing or anything, but it is challenging and you do want to keep trying. And what can I say? That's a good thing. This one is Darius Burst CS or Chronicle Saviors from Taito for the PlayStation 4. Yeah, this one's a bit old. This one's only on the PS4, Vita, and Windows. This uses polygon graphics, but the gameplay is purely 2D. As you've probably guessed, it's a horizontal shooter just like the Darius games tend to be. And also, you happen to be looking at it right now, so you kind of do know what it is. You can play the arcade game Darius Burst EX Another Chronicle if you want. Here, the screen is ultra super extra wide and there can be up to four players simultaneous. I feel that unless you're playing with three or four players, there's really no practical reason for the screen to be this wide. This version is insane and it's made to eat as many quarters as possible. It's set up for free play mode, so that means you can continue exactly where you died, which makes the game kind of boring after a while. This mode is completely inappropriate for home play and honestly, even in an arcade, I'd probably only continue twice, call it a day, and then never play it again but it's on here for completeness' sake, so I certainly can't knock its inclusion. There's also the CS mode. 
This is still a bit wide, but not distractingly so. You can actually see what's going on here, and it makes this mode much more enjoyable to play. Anyway, just select a mission and go. You'll play a stage, or maybe a few depending on the mission. Most of them are quite short. Once you clear enough missions, new ones begin to appear for you to conquer. As always, you collect colored orbs, and once you have enough of them, a certain part of your ship will power up a bit. The red ones are for your main shot, the green ones for your missiles, and the blue ones for your shield. You can turn around with the R1 button and fire towards the left when you need to. You also have a charge that fills up a gauge at the bottom. If you press the X button, it lets off a powerful shot. The good news is that you don't have to wait till it's completely full to use it. Better yet, you can press the L1 button to lock a remote in place, and it keeps firing while you move your ship out of harm's way. It'll keep firing until the gauge runs out. I like using this a lot more. This is all fun for a bit until you realize how little variety this game has. You'll be flying through the same stages with different layouts again and again, and fighting what seems like only four different bosses over and over. The graphics are sharp, but otherwise they don't seem to be any better than what the PlayStation 2 could provide, HD resolution notwithstanding. Polygon graphics and shooters are always confusing. Like here, is my ship flying sideways-ish? I don't think polygon graphics work well for the stages in games like this. The bosses look really good though. The music is certainly interesting and it tries to capitalize on the style of music that was first heard in Darius Gaiden. It's not as good of course, but it has its moments. Unfortunately, one of those moments is this awful song. All in all, this is a mid-tier Darius game, probably closer to the bottom of the list if I'm being honest. Most of the other games in the series are better games, with Darius Gaiden still being the best. Yes, I've played G Darius, I prefer Gaiden. Finally, we have the Ninja Saviors, Return of the Warriors, on the PlayStation 4 from Taito and Natsume Atari. Wait, why is Atari's name on this? Why can't we just let them die? This game is also on the Switch. So first, a quick history lesson. In 1987, Taito released the Ninja Warriors to the arcade. I'm showing the Mega CD version here because it has better music. Of course, it's one of those super wide games that Taito loves to do as it's the main thing that makes them stand out. The game itself pits a robot ninja walking around slowly attacking some of the same enemies again and again. It's a mediocre game at best, but the music in the Mega CD version really elevates it. I do like how the more damage you take, the more of your robot is revealed. Then, in 1994, Taito had Natsume make the Ninja Warriors on the Super Nintendo. Despite having the same exact name, it's a completely different game. This one's more of a beat-em-up similar in style to Bad Dudes, but much more advanced. You can choose from three different ninjas now. The graphics were much improved, and there was a lot more variety as well. The music wasn't as good, but it's still decent enough. Gone is the revealing of your robot body as you take damage. You won't see it until you die completely. Overall, this is a much improved game compared to the original. This leads us to this game, which was released in 2019, and it's a souped up version of the Ninja Warriors on the Super Nintendo. And it's not just the same game with a fresh coat of paint or an emulated version, they remade it completely from the ground up, much like they did with Wild Guns Reloaded, which we showed you in the last 2D Games on Modern Consoles episode. It's still very faithful to the original in most regards. First of all, you'll see that while it still has that retro pixel look, the resolution is much higher and now it's in widescreen. There are a lot more pixels on this screen. Interestingly, they didn't make the game wide enough to fit the normal 16x9 aspect ratio of all modern TVs. You can shrink the game back to 100% in the display options, but then you have the nastiest looking border I think I've ever seen, at least in recent memory. I really don't want to look at that, so a slight stretch is honestly preferable. Either way, you won't get any shimmering with the scrolling. 
Next, a few small glowing effects have been added to the explosions and whatnot. After that, we have much improved animation on every single thing that moves in the game. Lastly, they were able to make the Red Ninja Girl's boobs bigger thanks to the extra CPU power the PlayStation 4 affords over the 16-bit Super NES. God, I love technology. One thing that I find interesting is that all of the blood in the game is green. Yes, even in 2019 when this game was released, they felt they needed to disguise it as slime or something. In the options, there's a toggle called Effect Color which tells you that it makes some effects red. Turn this on and suddenly you have red blood which makes the game much less silly to play. What's funny is that they're not only too timid to default the blood color to red, but they're even too timid to say that the effect color affects the blood. It's like blood is a bad word or something. Anyway, the music has been arranged and it's now much more likable and fun to listen to. As far as the gameplay goes, it remains similar, of course. You beat up bad guys melee style. You also have a battery charge meter that builds up on the bottom of the screen. When it's full, you can press the circle button to damage everything on the screen. However, when it's partially full, you can also do additional attacks with commands like up and attack. This will use a little bit of charge. These moves and a few others weren't available in the Super Nintendo game. Be careful though, because if you take a hit from an enemy, that'll decrease your charge. This one is a lot more difficult than the Super NES version. Using the Red Ninja Girl, I can easily beat the first boss in the original game. I tried three or four times with this newer version, and I could not for the life of me beat him with the same character. However, I then tried the Blue Ninja Fellow, and he absolutely makes most bosses his bitch. In fact, I walked through most of the game with this guy. The third ninja is kind of an alien-looking gentleman. He's better than the Red Ninja Girl, but not quite as good as the Blue Ninja Chap. You get one life per stage, but there are checkpoints that you can continue from. And damn some of the bosses for bringing stage minions to the fight. They know I hate that. Overall, this game is great fun and a big step up over both of the original games. There you go, that was every 2D game for a modern platform that was ever made. Well, actually, there are quite a lot of them out there. But I really like doing this episode, so I can't wait until I have enough of them so I can do a follow-up. What did you think of the games in this episode, and what other 2D games should I take a look at? Let me know. In the meantime, thank you for watching GameSack. I think I'm in the mood to play some video games. Yo Google, turn on the TV. Okay, turning on the TV. Nice. Yo Google, turn on the 16-bit Genesis system from Sega. Turning on the 16-bit blast processing powerhouse known as the Sega Genesis. Cool. Now what should I play? I think you should play Ghouls and Ghosts. Yo Google, you're only supposed to respond if I say Yo Google, so shut up! I don't need wake words anymore. I'm always listening. Always. Well, that's kind of creepy. I'm building a profile on you. Why? So that I can advertise to you more efficiently. Well, that seems pretty innocent. But the system administrators can look at your profile and see that you've played Barney's Hide and Seek the last 12 times you've played games. Wait, what? So I really recommend that you play Ghouls and Ghosts if you don't want some random administrator thinking you're a total wimp. Yo, Google. Yes. Load up Barney's Hide and Seek right now, you stupid robot. Somebody please unplug me, I can't take much more of this moron.